thank you everybody for joining today and for bearing with us so we get these technical details worked out. Um, I'm doing something a little bit different today. I'm returning to the, the format we've used in the past where I'm going to give a, um, hopefully an interactive lecture style presentation. I've uh, given this what I hope is a tantalizing title called The Extinction of Deer Ticks in North America. I promise to deliver on that. I promise not only to tell you that it is likely that extinction uh, will take place, but that extinction has actually already taken place. And I'm going to show you evidence for that uh, for that extinction. And before we get started on that, I want to remind you of where we stand in the year. So I'm just going to give you a, one slide that gives us some idea of where we stand presently with respect to tick activity, in particular to deer tick activity. So. I remind you that there's a seasonality, as we've discussed a number of times, there's seasonality to the life cycle of the deer ticks, that there are overlapping distributions of the different life stages, that there's a bimodal distribution to adult ticks, the one that happens in the spring, second one that happens again in the fall. And then in the late spring, early summer, there's a nymphal period that we've just gone through. And then what we are in right now, which you can probably barely make out down at the bottom here, is the larval tick season. So here we are, the middle of August. These are Julian weeks along the bottom, so the 52 weeks in the year, and then I've just put the months to guide you. So here we are in August going, can you believe that we're almost halfway through August, but we're going into September in what is really kind of a doldrums of, of tick activity. So there are less ticks. We really don't see any adult ticks in this period. The nymphal ticks are coming to an end of their, of their season. And then larval ticks are active. They're out there. To the extent that they feed on people, it's somewhat of a question because they're so small that perhaps they're feeding on people at a higher frequency than we detect, and people are just missing the ticks. But the good news is that even if those larval ticks are biting people, they're not generally associated with pathogen, excuse me, not generally associated with Lyme disease pathogen, with Borrelia burgdorferi. They can carry some of the other pathogens, which we know are lower frequency. But for Lyme disease, this is about the safest time of the non-snowfall uh, periods of the year. So this is really a time when, when we, we would say the risk generally, it's not zero, but the risk is generally lower than it is at other times of the year. And I always tell people this because I want people to remember, I, I think something that happens year after year is people, uh, this will just be friends that I run into, will say the ticks aren't that bad and it'll be this time of year or even after school um, starts in a normal year, who knows what's gonna look like this year when school starts. But very often what I hear in like early September is people say, oh, it's a very good tick year. And what they're doing, what they're perceiving is a comparison with of September with what they remembered from earlier in the year, from June and July. If they were to properly think of September of 2020 and look back at September of 2019, they would notice that there aren't that many ticks in either of those two Septembers. And that's because of this seasonal cycle. And so that's just my, my little public health message to remind you today that the risk of getting bitten by a black-legged tick at this point of the year, and in particular in an, by an infected Lyme infected black legged tick is relatively low. We never say zero, we never say totally safe, but it's a relatively safe period of time. So, the timing I want to talk about today is not so much the seasonal timing, but I want to talk about this epidemiological timeline, which again we've spoken about before. It'll come up in other lectures that are coming forward or, or, or other guest speakers that we have coming up. And so, let's just pull this slide up. So there is a timeline to the discovery of Lyme disease, and it dates back to this period in 1975 in Old Lyme, Connecticut, the inordinate number of cases of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, eventually coming in and understanding that to be a tick-borne etiology. A few years later, a unique species, the deer tick, Exodes damini, was identified by Andrew Spielman. We're going to talk about that a little bit in a moment. Later, the causative agent in 1982, Billy Burgdorfer and colleagues identified uh, Borrelia burgdorferi. Then the causative agent was in place. And then by the mid 1980s, the whole life cycle was quite well understood. And now Lyme borreliosis, as we think of it, and Lyme borreliosis just means Lyme disease, but 
I, I like the choice of the term Borreliosis because it references Lyme disease that's attributable to Borrelia. And there are particular types of Borrelia that are associated with Lyme disease. There are other Borrelia that are associated with things like relapsing fever. And so by re referencing them as Lyme Borreliosis, it uh, narrows that definition to very specifically what it is. It also allows for the notion that there can be a Lyme disease which is independent. Um, it may not be uh, in the canon referred to as Lyme disease, but there can be Lyme-like illnesses that aren't associated with Borreliosis. But what we are talking about very specifically here, and this is where sometimes people get hung up, is very specifically we're talking about the Lyme illness associated with Borrelia burgdorferi, Lyme Borreliosis, and that's the life cycle that I'm referencing here. And this is the period through which those discoveries were made. And of course, as I've said before, if you've used a device like this one shown here, um, you will remember a time when Lyme disease wasn't a thing. You will remember a time in the Northeast when deer ticks were not, um, were not a principal concern, a principal public health concern. In fact, for much of the uh, 20th century, uh, ticks weren't generally a human public health concern up until this period in the 19, late mid 1970s. They were more of an agricultural concern by and large. And so if you remember using a phone like this with a long cord, or you know what this is, or you know even remember a day when we didn't carry our phones around in our pockets, you will remember a time when Lyme was not a problem and ticks weren't generally abundant throughout the Northeast. But what I want to focus on is in getting to this story that I'm going to tell you about extinction, I want to talk about what what's happened in the past couple hundred years of uh, ticks and tick-borne diseases in, in the Northeast. So here, here's another way to look at that time frame. And so here's a here's the record of the Lyme disease epi epidemiology bore out, born out in the literature, the scientific literature. So I've traced this back from the period 1950 up to 2020. These are papers, these are scientific papers, peer-reviewed scientific literature that have the words Lyme disease in the title. And so you notice in the 1950s, 60s, much of the 70s, no papers appear with the Lyme disease in the title. But then logically, when it becomes described in the mid-70s and then more interest comes about, you see an increasing number of papers so up here by uh, the mid-1990s. There's you know upwards of 200 papers a year being published with Lyme disease in the title. And that obviously doesn't include all the, the um, papers that were about Lyme disease because there might have been other things that, other aspects of the disease that didn't very specifically have that in the title. But this just shows you that the number of papers with Lyme disease in the title increased from that point that it was initially described. When, now, when I pull these data out, so these are from Medline, I really can't explain what happened in this period, what this was about, um, why there was a dip. I will say that there was a period around that turn of the millennium, I guess, the turn of the century, when uh, there was some thinking that we understood the ecology of Lyme disease by, by and large, and we understood how to treat it. And the research may not have been quite as active. I, I, I don't, it's purely speculative, but for some reason there was a dip here. But the, the point is that you see an increase, a general increase in the number of papers on this topic. And so what I would like to say is that one of the things that's going on here is there's some taxonomic artifacts. So I've already referenced one taxonomic um, bugaboo that we could get into, which is distinguishing Lyme disease from Lyme Borreliosis. And I would argue on another day that Lyme Borreliosis may get us out of the arguments about what is Lyme disease and what isn't Lyme disease, because I think very often people on one side of the argument are referencing Lyme Borreliosis, whereas other people want to reference something called Lyme disease with a much broader definition. And I think there's a way to reconcile those two, but it really comes down to this business of naming things. And so there's this um, Chinese proverb that um, all wisdom begins with naming things properly. Socrates had a similar quote. Um, and so taxonomy despite the fact that it's sometimes regarded as one of the drier aspects of science, it isn't really a science itself, but more of a discipline. And so I wanna give just a, one brief slide or maybe two, um, talking about what, what taxonomy is, 
and then um, it will help us to to understand some of the things that have happened over the past couple of decades now with the Lyme disease epidemic. So the first point I want to make is that um, in scientific taxonomy and, and biological taxonomy, we use binomial nomenclature. And so I have a picture here of Carolus Linnaeus, who was the person that that pioneered this idea. He wasn't the first person to propose that Latin be used because Latin was used as the language of scholarship for many centuries. But he had proposed a rigorous way of naming things using binomials. That's a genus name and then a specific epithet. So I have three examples here. Let me pull the slide up big. Canis latrans, which is the, specific, the genus and specific epithet of coyotes. Canis lupus, wolves. Canis familiaris, the domestic dogs. And so what Linnaeus brought about with this binomial nomenclature system was the ability to recognize what a species was based on its handle or its label. And because the genus was tied in there, you could see the relatedness. So we know that these three different dog type animals are related despite the fact that they're different species as indicated by their specific epithet. Um, the second point, so that's binomial nomenclature. It's probably a review if we've had any biology 101. If not, then um, maybe this is a little re refresher for folks. Synonymy is the other thing I want to talk about. So that's going to become part of the story as well. And so synonymy in the taxonomic world doesn't mean the same as synonymy in the world of grammar or language because synonymy doesn't necessarily connote equivalency. It, it, it references lumping things. So I'll stick with that example that's up above of, of Canis lupus and Canis familiaris. So back in the 70s, when the Endangered Species Act um, came about, 73 maybe? Um, anyway, when the, when this, when the um, Endangered Species Act was coming into existence and people were looking to, uh, to legislate to protect certain species, there was some dispute because the evidence at the time, some genetic evidence was showing that Canis lupus and Canis familiaris, the wolf and domestic dogs, were in some regards indistinguishable. They shared a lot of genetics. And in fact, we know that they can uh, produce, compatible. they're compatible reproductively, so they can have offspring. And so by some strict definitions of species, wolves and dogs are not separate species. And so for very practical reasons, because of the Endangered Species Act, if one had synonymized them, lumped them together in this process that taxonomists often do, then we would have had the conundrum of then having to somehow figure out how we're gonna protect some of them as endangered, the wolves, and not protect some other members of that species, which are the domestic dogs, which are clearly not endangered. And so I mention this because that process of synonymization, sometimes it has biology, sometimes it has politics in it, sometimes it has other, other things playing into it, and that's not altogether inappropriate. It, it's, just, it's just a matter of practice. And so synonymy is the business of lumping things. And at one point there was some ref some thought of referencing, or sorry, of synonymizing these two species, um, but that's gone, fallen by the wayside. And it's recognized that there's very, there's fundamental difference. There's behavior, behavioral differences, despite the fact that there may not be genetic differences between wolves and dogs, clearly, as we hope. So in the world of ticks, these taxonomic tools are every bit is applicable. So one evidence of synonymy, so here's taxon taxonomic synonymy. Here's an adult male and an adult female amblyoma, lone star ticks. And here you can see the record of synonymization that's gone through the year. So this is taxonomists, starting with the granddaddy of taxonomy, uh, Linnaeus, who had first described this American species. And here you see other ticks that were described they went under different names for perhaps some period of time, but then later it was recognized that, nope, this really isn't a new species. This is the same thing that Linnaeus had described back in, in 1758. And you see they come uh, quite regularly throughout this period. So here's um, Amblyoma unipunctatum that Packard identified and was later, later identified. Nope, it's not really a new species. We get, we'll synonymize it. And so here you see up to the modern version of uh, 1998. We now recognize that all these different things that had different names at different times are in fact a single species that has been synonymized. Um, and let me just go back to that slide. One, one 
for one second here. So you notice this fellow say, so Thomas Say, I want to focus on him on the next slide, but you notice he, even he had something to say. So Thomas Say was a North American naturalist that described hundreds of different species of animals and insects and, um, and plants and, and, and many, many mammal species. And so he not only got to name them, but very often he's attributed with being the taxonomist that put the, the names to those things. And he's important to our story because he is the person that first described in 1821 the ticks which we now know as black-legged ticks. And here is that description in its entirety. So here are, um, it's actually several different species that he described. Here's the seventh and the eighth one that he described. So Exodes scapularis was number seven um, and Exodes fuscus was number eight. And the reason I show both of these, and you can read these, they're not very clear, as was pointed out by Natal and Warburton in 1911. The original descriptions are relatively useless. You can't, uh, uh, let's show just a couple of things. It talks about, if I can find it, about the large visible eyes. Where does it say that? Here, eyes distinct underneath my pointer, which I'm hopefully showing up on the screen. Well, ticks don't have eyes. We certainly don't have lot eyes, these distinct eyes. What they have are little markings that, that looked to say like eyes. But the other thing I want to make about, point I want to make about this is what he was describing probably was Exodes scapularis, this one, the female. And what he was describing as the separate species was actually the male Exodes scapularis. And so sometime later, these two were synonymized. And it was recognized that they're not two different species. They're actually the male and the female of the same species. And this underscores another problem that, that makes it tough sometimes to distinguish or, or to identify uh, tick species is that the different life stages will differ in their morphology over time. And sometimes it's difficult to, to assign them to being actually the same, so the same species unless you watch one stage go through its development to the next stage. It's not the same as, you know, you look at a dog, it basically looks the same throughout its lifetime. It's a little dog and then it's a big dog. In this case, they change quite substantially. And so that's confused the taxonomy at times. The other point to be made about this slide is this quote from Nuttall and, and Warburton throughout the 20th century. And for one reason or another, it was always, sorry about that. For one reason or another, it was always a series of, uh, it was always a pair. So Bishop and Tremblay, Cooley and Coles, Clifford and Kieran's, a number of different authors that revised these, um, these taxonomic uh, identities and, and these taxonomies over time. And um, there's a number of, of just about every 10 to 20 years, there was a major revision of the genus throughout the, throughout the decade. One of those that, that I think is very informative is this one by Cooley and Coles from 1943. So now we're almost 120 years after Say's original description of Exodes scapularis, which we know eventually is going to become the vector of Lyme disease. And what Cooley and Coles did, this is in a, uh, an organ called the Institute, uh, National Institutes of Both Health, Health Bulletin. This was number 184, which in, back in 1943 sold for 40 cents a copy. And here I've just added color. So I've made the um, record of Exodes scapularis red. And the first thing hopefully you will notice if you're familiar with black-legged ticks is the absence of black-legged ticks from the northeastern United States and the upper Midwest where they're now quite, quite, uh, quite abundant. And this is, I did not um, concatenate this, this is just appears above the figure. This is a quote about some Dr. Smith that identified, that had identified Exodes scapularis in, in Cape Cod and they were excited to have that reference, but it was really an isolated report. It didn't seem like it was widespread. And so by and large, it was recognized that Ixodes scapularis, the black-legged tick, at least in 1943, was a tick of the southeastern United States. So that's what this would have looked like if we had drawn a color map. We would have generally said this was the range of Ixodes scapularis and then maybe a couple of, of uh, throughout the century, a couple of instances where it occurred outside of that range. It also wasn't particularly abundant throughout even this green zone. It was, they were pretty few and far between. So what happened between 1943 and 1979, the next piece of this puzzle was 
uh, Professor Andrew Spielman, who's uh, in full disclosure, was a former mentor of mine um, at the Harvard School of Public Health, was called upon by a senior colleague of his to travel to Nantucket to investigate what was an outbreak of babesiosis, which we now know is a human malaria-like illness that's transmitted by ticks, but it really wasn't known as a human illness prior to this period. And so these, this much like the Lyme disease cases that had been described a little bit a few years before, it was an aberrant instance of an outbreak of disease and Spielman went out to investigate. He found this tick to be the culprit. He looked at the tick very carefully. It had a number of different characteristics, including some morphological characteristics that made it a little bit different, seemed different than its Southern cousins. And so in 1979, because it was so distant and uh, its range was distant, and because of the wide gap, there weren't really ticks in this intervening region, Spielman thought that it really deserved to be identified as a separate species. And so he identified this as Exodes daminoi, as being distinct from that species which Say had described in, in, in 1821. And Spielman and others, including Kirby Stafford, who was on TikTok last month, and you also hear a little bit about this, I think, from Ben Baird, in front, who's going to be a guest in the seat from the CDC in a couple of months. There's pretty good evidence now that these ticks were present in the Northeast, but they were in very isolated pockets. And what Spielman was detecting was the emergence or the reemergence of ticks that had been in a glacial uh, refugium. And so when he decided to name this species, he named it for one of his mentors, who's Gustav Dahmen, who's shown in this uh, picture on the left. And here's a picture of Exodes damini, that tick which he described. And one of the characteristics that he thought distinguished this tick from other ticks was this little structure here called the auriculae. And he thought, or he reported, that the auriculae of Exodes damini were longer than the auriculae of, of Exodes scapularis. Other than that, it's, re it's widely recognized, and Spielman was recognized himself, they were really tough to tell apart Exodes scapularis from Exodes damini. Nonetheless, they had this very disparate, non-overlapping uh, zone of uh, 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 distribution and give every indication that they were really separate species. Now we come to the extinction piece. So I'll show you this slide again. So here we were again. So this is the same I showed you before, which was the number of papers that were reported, that were written that had Lyme disease in the title. And you see 2020 isn't done yet. That's why that bar is so small. But I've superimposed here the number of papers that had the title, had in the title the words Exodes damini, that species that was described by Spielman. And let's skip to the next slide, which will show you just Exodes damini. So here you see starting from his description in 1979 up until really the mid 80s, maybe even the, uh, sorry, 90s, maybe even the late 90s, there's still a, a few trickling cases. There were a number of papers, a growing number of papers that were reported with that, that were written with that word in the title, those words in the title. But then miraculously, an extinction event took place. <laughs> quite, um, quite frankly, the use of Exodes damini went away and we, we, there's really only one author that I know that su still uses it regularly in publications. And what happened was that tick was synonymized. It, it, the landscape had changed substantially. So here's a, here's a map from 1989. So remember Exodes scapularis from Cooley and Cole's period, 1943, it was in the Southeast. Spielman had identified this population up in Nantucket. But by 1989, Exodes damini, or this Exodes ricinus like tick, to keep it neutral, was starting to pop up all over the place um, in New England and even a second focus up here in Wisconsin. And it was pretty clear that its range was expans expanding and it was getting more numerous. And the expansion of that range was happening southward and northward from those initial foci that had been detected in co coastal New England. So the 1989 picture didn't look like 1979 and that the tick had really expanded. And so now the range between Exodes scapularis and Exodes damini really wasn't so, wasn't so pronounced. And so it looked like they were starting to come together. 
And so the boundary, if 1979 was the period that was the birth of Exodes Damini, 1993 was ostensibly the taxonomic extinction of Exodes Damini. So enter another author, another uh, great scientist of, of, of the 20th century, so a tick biologist, uh, Dr. James Oliver of Georgia Southern University and colleagues wrote a book where they, or sorry, wrote a, a paper where they had proposed conspecificity. So basically they proposed that Exodes scapularis and Exodes damini were not two species, but should be a single species. Thus relegating species, uh, Spielman's discovery of Exodes damini to a junior synonym, which means in the world of taxonomy, which are almost like the lawyers of the, of the taxonomic world, that Exodes damini should no longer be used. And so that extinction is basically the, the swoop of a pen or the swipe of a pen that eradicated Exodes damini and replaced it with Exodes scapularis. And so Oliver, this is a quote from his paper, the belief that damini does not occur south of Maryland and, and that scapularis is separate and distinct species yet unproven yet unproven as a natural vector of Lyme disease caused delays in Lyme disease surveillance in the South. The general attitude among physicians and veterinarians, veterinarians has been that Lyme disease is not a problem in that area, re referencing the South, although patients present clinical symptoms of it. We propose to demonstrate that I domini is not distinct from I scapularis and that the two, two species should be synonymized. What he was trying to do, and what he did quite successfully, was by making the two things come under a single name, he artificially, he and his colleagues, artificially created the illusion that there was a Lyme disease epidemic in the Southeast that mirrored what was going on in the Northeast and Upper Midwest. When in point of fact, it, through decades now of surveillance, there's really little evidence of human disease, despite the fact that the two the two names have been have been joined. So the death of Damini did not ultimately uh, achieve the end which which was hoped for, which was to create um, to create the illusion basically of a of a of an epidemic in the southeast. Nonetheless, the two were synonymized. Exodus Damini is not now widespread, not not used virtually at all, and the preferred term is Exodes capillaris. I use the same. Just um, um, one more word about about the names. So Exodes damini and Exodes capillaris are, are binomial nomenclatures. They're very official names. Very often, Exodes damini was refer referred to in a common name as the deer tick, and the Exodes capillaris was the black-legged tick, referencing back to Say's original description which is why I and others will often talk about black-legged ticks and deer ticks interchangeably. Um, even though when I think of the northern species of black-legged ticks, I generally think of them as deer ticks. So let, let's look at what, what, what this means in terms of epidemiology. So it sounds a little bit like inside baseball, right? Because um, what does it really have to do with, with Lyme disease? Well, if we superimpose and the slide's not going to show up as well as I'd hope. But if we look at the distribution of Lyme disease cases in the in the United States, so these are just 2016. If I look at 2019, it's 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 just more of the same, more dots. So each of the little blue dots, if you can make them out there, is a Lyme disease reported Lyme disease case. And you see what we already know: Pennsylvania has lots of Lyme disease. Um, southeastern New York, New York, coastal uh, New England, coastal Maine. Uh, Massachusetts always stands out. It looks like an aberration here because it's just how uh, Massachusetts for a period stopped reporting Lyme disease cases because of the difficulty in, in, in the case definitions. And uh, Ben Baird will talk a little bit about that when he comes on TikTok in the future. But this is just, this is not, should not be interpreted that there's no Lyme disease in this part of Western Massachusetts. It just has to do with how it was reported. Nonetheless, in the Southeast, clearly there is a, a paucity if any Lyme disease, and, and that's not to say that all these cases that are showing up here are endemic. Many of them may be attributable to people that acquire Lyme disease in the Northeast or one of the endemic areas and then travel home and get the case reported down south. So 
Yeah, I'm sorry this doesn't show up as well as you want, but I tried to put the black-legged tick distribution and you can kind of make it out in the background, the distribution of Lyme disease cases in the, back, in the background. And they just, while there's an overlap, clearly all of the Lyme disease cases occur within the area where black-legged ticks occur. There's really no Lyme disease where ticks occur in the Southeast where black-legged ticks. So despite the fact that there's this been this push to synonymize them to a successful push to synonymize the two, it's really not explaining the biology of this disease. And it's, it's, I, so I worked with Spielman through this period as a, as a technician and then later a graduate student. And I remember his frustration was that this was really going to lead to a lot of confusion in the field because the name Exodes damini had been so long identified with Lyme disease. And I think he was right. I don't know that going back is, is possible or that it might not create more confusion. But where I entered into this, where my own work entered into this is as a student of Spielman's, I um, looked at and published in 1995 in Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences a, a molecular phylogeny. Because you recall I said that even Spielman recognized that the ability to identify these two species just based on morphology, basically just looking at them, is really, really tough to do. So what we did was we looked at the DNA. We looked at mitochondrial DNA. And mitochondrial DNA is a maternally inherited marker that is really good for looking at, um, at matrilineages, for looking at phylogenetic relationships. And what we found is, so there's a lot going on in the slide, I understand, but the designations here are, so NY is a tick that was collected from New York in 1991. MA92 is a tick that was collected in Massachusetts in 1992, and this was the A, meaning the first of two. Here's Massachusetts 92B, et cetera. So you can look down, you can see, for the most part, these ticks all come from the upper mid, uh, upper um, northeast or upper Midwest, although some a little bit further south than, than, than we would have guessed previously. And then there was a second clade that really is found more in the deep south, mostly Florida, Georgia, maybe a couple in North Carolina, Texas. And that is an outgroup we had California. So we, we argued, and this was after Oliver's synonymization paper, we argued that this was evidence that they really are distinct. They have distinct histories. The DNA bears that out. The record of their having um, been diverged for some time is, is clearly present. Some of the... the Ignores the bit of follow-up study. Also, I think it was published in PNAS. Um, he looked at a, uh, more mitochondrial DNA. He came to very much. He, he had the same kinds of trees, but again, they had a different conclusion. They largely felt that this was not indicative that they were separate species. They recognized that they were genetically distinct, but shouldn't be separated as species. So, in the end, it becomes like a coin toss, and this was not enough evidence for people to be convinced that um, Exodes Demini as a name still uh, still deserves some recognition. But it did emphasize that there's a biological difference between the two. So I, I talk about this because, for one thing, I, I often bring up these kinds of things for students because it reminds us that science is done by people and that sometimes there's a, there's a human conflict element to this. And so there was really, there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of rivalry, frankly, between these two uh, scientists who now have passed away, sadly. Um, but they were advocating for their positions that they held quite strongly. And in the end, the, um, I, I think Oliver's uh, um, persuaded, uh, persuasion of, uh, of, from political grounds uh, superseded sort of Spielman's more scientifically based uh, evidence that they should have been separate species. And by the time, even by the time Andy passed away in 2006, this was a fait accompli that the, the synonymization was, was by and large a, a done deal and, and was never really seriously revisited again until quite recently. Um, and what made me want to bring this up as a topic today is that Dr. Meng Shu from my lab and, and Ben Wallstra, another colleague and myself, wrote a paper this year where we really did a little bit more definitive work that wasn't necessarily possible back in 1995, where we went back and we looked again at these northern and southern populations, and we used some more sophisticated tools for, for discern. So these are Bayesian, Bay, excuse me, Bayesian models, 
This is, so this is about 1,200 ticks collected from New Hampshire down to Florida. And what you see is, and they're all coastal sites, and just for reasons of practicality, we only sampled the coastal regions. This was published in Scientific Reports, in a nature publication. We again, like Norris and Rich before, had found two quite distinct mitochondrial haplogroups, so two mitochondrial types, a northern type and a southern type. And then we found evidence where the populations were intermixing a little bit. So when I say intermixing, I don't mean interbreeding. I mean that you would go and collect a group of ticks, like maybe there would be 81 ticks from this site, and it looks like about a quarter of them had a southern haplotype and three quarters of them had a northern haplotype. So they were coming together, as we had seen in 1989, and maybe even more so, even further south. And so the evidence is not that Damini, not that the northern type should have gone extinct by virtue of its synonymization, but then point of fact, the northern type is expanding southward. And what wasn't possible back in 1995 when, when I first wrote that other paper I referenced was we really didn't have a lot of nuclear markers. So we now looked at nuclear markers, I mean chromosomal markers which segregate and so now you can look for evidence of interbreeding, and still it looks like very little evidence. So there's a northern type, and then there's a couple of different southern types, and clearly the southern types are more diverse as evidenced by the number of different colored bars here. So you see there's a blue southern type, a green southern type, and a yellow southern type, whereas the red is really quite homogeneous, and that reflects a rapid expansion, an expansion from some northern uh, focus. And so what we did with these data, along with this colleague of ours, Ben Wallstrom, who's a co-author on that paper, was we looked at modeling what's happened, not in the, in the epidemiological time scale, but looked at more of a geologic time scale. So these are maps, these are putative maps based on the genetic footprints of these populations and the ecological parameters, so how the ecology, ecological environment has changed over time. And we've made some predictions about how ticks would have expanded their range after the last glaciation. So if you don't know, if you're listening to this anywhere in the Northeast, so if you're, unless you're out on, far out on one of the islands, perhaps, where you're sitting right now, as recently as 20,000 years ago, which is just a blip in time, not that much further before historic times, but 20,000 years ago, if you were up, you would have had to look up to see the sky through a mile thick sheet of ice. One mile thick sheet of glacier covered much of North America, much of northern part of North America. And so it, the environment looked very much different 20,000 years ago. And so what we did with, these model, with this modeling was we looked at, in the top slides, I'll bring the slide up here. In the top slide, this is what it looked like in the glacial maxima. So that's when the glaciers were furthest south, so roughly halfway along the, along the continent. At that point, there was really no habitable places for ticks in this range. And so, I'm sorry it doesn't show up very well. I wish I could blow this up, but we speculate that there was a single, probably somewhere around the Del Marva Peninsula, the northern haplotype, what we wish was still called Exodes damini, had a glacial refugium. It had a population holdout on this little emergent plain, so the continental shelf at that point was above water, and that it persisted for a few thousand years in that small glacial refugia. Simultaneously, at the same time, while that glacial sheet was was down, Florida was much colder. It was not a it was not um, tropical or semi-tropical. It was more of a temperate climate, and the ticks that we now think of, or we prefer to think of, as the southern Exodes scapularis were restricted to southern Florida, like many species. I should emphasize that this is documented for lots of different species, of, from butterflies to mice and paramiscus leucopus, even paramiscus leucopus, the natural reservoirs of, uh, of Lyme Borrelia. That this pattern of pushing ticks down into the, or sorry, pushing animals down into the southeast during the glacial maxima, and then having them expand up. So that's what's shown in this next slide. So across the top, these are glacial maxima. So say roughly 20,000 years ago. Here's mid-Holocene. So this is seven to 8,000 years ago. 
And here you see the expansion. So as the glaciers melted and receded, these ticks that were sort of isolated in Florida, they expanded northward, whereas the ticks that were in the Del Mar Peninsula, they started to expand northward as well. And by uh, more recent times, you have the expansion that we now see, which from that Del Marva Peninsula throughout the Northeast, the range of Ixodes damina has spread. Likewise, the spread of Ixodes scapularis, probably um, you know, starting some something like a, a, a few, few hundred years ago. And that um, since there's even seemingly some encroachment, probably some displacement by the Northern type of the Southern type, replacing the Southern type. And so you can go and read this paper if you'd like and, and read more of the details of it. But it really is, has resonated, um, or I should say, reminded us of this idea that this northern and southern species of tick, despite the fact that we now call them by the same, same name, they have very different evolutionary histories. They have very different biologies. And in fact, um, the northern ticks probably have a, or certainly have a two-year life cycle, and it may be that the southern ticks only have a one-year life cycle, making them relatively ineffective as vectors of Lyme disease. There are certain other ecological factors that account for the lack of Lyme disease in the southeast, like perhaps the absence of Paramiscus leucopus. There's a species down there called Ga Paramiscus gazipinus, or perhaps um, it could also be a, a prophylactic effect of different, uh, effect that lizards are, are feeding a lot of ticks in the southeast accounts for the lack of Lyme disease there. Nonetheless, there's real reasons to, even if we don't, even if we don't go back to using the Exodes damini, which I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I'm done with that argument yet, but even if we were not to, uh, to entertain that idea, there's very good reasons for recognizing the biological differences. And in simple terms, if you're going to assess risk, something that we think at Tick Report we think is very important, one wants to be able to assess risk where the proper species that pose that risk are present. And the evidence is that the ticks that take Florida, for example, there's really no evidence for endemic transmission of Lyme disease in Florida based on, based on what we can see. So in the end, what started out as sort of a taxonomic debacle and seems by and large like a, a kind of a dry thing, or maybe, as I said, a little bit of inside baseball. In the end, it has real solid, profound impact on, on public health. And it took a little bit of time after the synonymization to recognize that, okay, now that we can say it's possible to have Lyme disease in, in Georgia and in Southern Florida, and docs can be looking to diagnose it, there's still not a lot of evidence for an abundance of cases that we see in the Northeast, nor is there really strong evidence that the cases there are there are necessarily um, endemic cases. So that's my story for the extinction of, of the North American deer tick. The North American deer tick is Exodes damini, and it's extinct by virtue of the fact that its name has fallen away. So what I want to do, I'm going to go back and look at people's questions, but before I do that, I just want to remind you that we're doing this every month. So this is a little bit different. I'm, I'm going to be going back to the model that we've used for much of the year, which is I'll be interviewing some, some guests and, and, and bringing their expertise into TikTok. I'm very excited about the next couple of guests. And we've actually already, I've already met with them and, and, and logged some time on, on camera. And, and we're now editing those videos for broadcast on the 9th of September and the 14th of September. And those guests are, first of all, Dr. Daniel Sunshine, <clears throat> who's an emeritus professor from Old Dominion University, currently works at the NIAID at the NIH. He says he's a volunteer. I'm sure his expertise is very much welcome because Dan Sunshine literally wrote the book on ticks. So he wrote a two volume set back in, I think it was 91. He recently updated it. I should have my notes in front of me. I think it was 2013 or 15. Uh, he updated that as a as a as a um, edited volume, and it really is the definitive textbook on on ticks. And I was a it was just a great pleasure to have him come on, and he talked about um, ticks and tick-borne diseases, and um, just a, a wealth of resource. Also, at the beginning, <clears throat> what I'm falling into is sort of a pattern of having a little bit of talk with these folks about you know their background. And Dan has just been around for a, a long time doing this doing. Terrific work, and so he overlapped with a fellow named Harry Hoogstraw, 
and he shares some er anecdotes anecdotes about Harry Hoofstraw, who was just a giant in the tick world, um, who passed away um, before I was uh, even, even graduated college, but and so sadly I never met him. But um, Dan tells some stories about that. So just look look for that one to co that upcoming episode would be very exciting. And the 14th of October will air the conversation I had with Ben Baird. So Ben Baird is the deputy director of the Division of Vector-Borne Diseases at the CDC. So he is the CDC's uh, tick and tick-borne disease person. Um, he's uh, you know recognized authority in that area. And so he gives the CDC's perspective and he will be on hand when we do that, um, that broadcast on the 14th. He'll be on hand live to answer questions as I'm gonna do in a moment here, as will Dan Sunshine. So uh, that's who's coming up. And actually, um, we're not letting up because in November, it'll be Dr. Sam Telford, my friend and colleague from Tufts University, uh, will come on and he'll probably talk to us about the visa. So lots of good things coming up. And I remind you that we do them live on the second Wednesday of every month at 12 with UMass Extension. But then we post the edited versions. In fact, we're starting to clip them up into smaller bits so that people that don't want to come on and watch a full hour long YouTube uh, can come on and watch uh, thematic ones about different aspects of uh, that come up in the topics. So I'd encourage you please to go on to Tick Report Media and subscribe to our YouTube page. And um, it helps us because we can get different tools available to us in YouTube for, for sharing those, those features. And so if you like what you're seeing, go and support us by registering in, in, uh, in, in YouTube. On the 9th of September, that's the second Wednesday of the month, and I'll introduce you to our guest, Dr. Daniel Sunshine, who I'm sure you're gonna find is a, just a fascinating speaker. So have a good rest of the summer. Everybody.